And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Reconciled invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Welcome to the How to Exit Podcast. Today, I'm here with Mohit Tater, and he is the founder of Black Book Investments, which is a micro uh, investment fund. We'll have him explain to us what that is in a second here. But thank you for being on the show today, Guy. Happy to be here, Ronald. Thanks for having me. I always do the origin story. The running joke is, and, I, and everybody's probably sick of hearing it. It's like, hey, you were born. Now you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisitions. Could you fill out that small gap uh-huh. in between? Tell us who you are, where you're from, and kind of how did you get into this space? What made you do this? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Mohit Taylor. I'm from a city called Jodhpur in India. It's also called the Sun City or the Blue City because all the houses are painted blue here. <laughs> Um, and, uh, Nick Jonas got married here. So yeah, that's where I'm from. And, um, I have been, yeah, I've, I've been born and brought up here, grown up here and then left for college, which is not too far from where my city is. And, um, I did my engineering, you know, studied for four years, but while during college, I always have this bug in me to, um, do something of my own. And even before that, actually during school, during high school, I had read a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, which kind of planted the seed of doing my own thing, doing my own business, owning a asset, owning a business, which then was further strengthened by Tim Ferriss's book, uh, Four Hour Work Week, which I read in, in, in college. And right after college, I, I took up a job with a startup uh, called Zomato. I took it up just because I wanted to see how it's to work a job before I could take a call on, you know, going my own way. And I decided I'll do it for about a year and then probably quit and then go to my own thing, which is what exa- exactly I did. But during this uh, one year, I kind of learned how to build websites, learn how to code just in the evenings and on the weekends. And why I chose to do that was because I was trying to, because of the two books that I'd read, I was trying to make a source of income from being location independent or time independent. and as most of us would do, we would type in how to make money online in Google and try to come up with ways in which we can make money online. So I read blogging was pretty hot. So I thought maybe I should blog. So I started building websites, blogging, uh, and seeing if that worked for me. That unfortunately didn't work for me. Um, and even after I quit my job, I was trying to make a go at it, but it didn't work for me. So I was at, at it about, uh, for about a year, but no luck. I didn't make a penny. Then I was like, okay. There must be some other way. Someone introduced me to a, a marketplace called Flippa, flippa.com, which is a marketplace for buying and selling online businesses and websites. And uh, I browsed it for a few weeks before liking something. It was a small, like $500 business. I had the money saved up. I bought some, um, some from my parents and I, I kind of took the plunge. I, you know, sent $2,500 to guy I didn't, and I didn't know. And I was like, you know, what's going to happen? I'm shooting in the dark here. It was a business basically that was providing social media marketing services, like increasing followers and likes and all that stuff, which was very popular back then, 10 years ago. And this is all 2012, 2013. So that luckily for me, that worked out well. It was a legit thing that he was doing and nothing was misrepresented. So I took on the business. I grew it further, like almost fivefold, you know, mm-hmm. increased income by reaching out to more clients or converting cold leads into warm ones and the warm leads to 
comes to customers. And probably six, seven months down the line, I, I ended up selling it for 5X what I bought it for, 12500 and also made some money during, you know, it was in my, you know, ownership. So that was a nice chunk of change for me because my salary when I was working was about probably 500 bucks a month. So yeah, getting all this money in a two years worth of income in one go was, mm -hmm. yeah, a huge sum for me. So I was like, okay, I had always wanted to travel to the States. So I, I packed my bags and visited the States. I went to New York, uh, visited my friend, was there for almost like two, three months in the U.S. and mm -hmm. was with my friend for about a, a month or so. Yeah. And all this, one, like while this was going on, I, I did buy another one that I got scammed on that was for $3,500 and the income on that was misrepresented. It was an income from some other source or some other business, which was being portrayed as income from this business and I got scammed out of my money. But luckily I, I had some money, like I said, from the exit. So I didn't lose hope. I went at it and the third one worked well. It was also something similar. And the fourth one, that's how Black Tip came about. I was visiting my friend. He saw me every day, like working out of my laptop or from cafes. And he was like, what do you do? I want to know. He was uh, in a hedge fund. He was working in a hedge fund and he had some cash lying around, some money. He said, let's do this. You know, why not I invest in something, you know, in a website and you can manage it for me. And that's how the idea for Black Tip was born. We looked for a website for him to buy. We found one, we, we bought it. And then I started managing it for him. He got a good ROI. So after about a few months, he got his friends and family all involved. So we bought more sites for them. And then how, that's how in 2014, Blackpool Investments came about due to a, a need in the market. So that's the origin story of, of Blackpool Investments. Yeah. It's interesting. We, we share a little bit of a similar path. I'm a, probably a few years older than you. Back before Flippa was around and before pretty much any of those sites were around, uh, yeah. you could buy and sell websites on a, on a thing called the Warrior Forum. And it was, yeah. a, it was just a news group. So I was doing the same thing with your, you started off. I bought, I buy small revenue generating most of the time websites that they didn't know how to do web development. They had an idea, they put it together, they got customers coming in, they were making some money. Uh, maybe it was as yeah. dense or maybe it was, you know, affiliate or whatever, but they were making some money, but they, they didn't know graphic design. They didn't know anything. And I've always mm -hmm. been kind of good at all of it. So I would come right. in and uh, grab it. And I had a couple of programmers that worked for me and uh, in India, but um, I had a mm -hmm. couple of guys, but even way back then uh, I would find them on Skype. <laughs> and then what happened to yeah. me is the same thing that happened to you. I kept buying bigger ones and bigger ones. And, you know, I uh -huh. bought one. Luckily, I stepped down. I was buying yeah. some pretty good size sites, six figure sites. That by the time I was getting there, I was like, "Hey, this is something I'm going to do." Hmm. And I bought, I bought a smaller one that was doing about thirty six thousand dollars. I paid thirty six thousand dollars for it. I bought it because it had great traffic. They were doing. Uh, I basically paid two x two years worth of revenue. They were doing okay. Mm -hmm. I thought I bought it right. In 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 these days, in terms, that's still a great price. Unfortunately, yeah. they had a thing going on that I didn't even know existed back then. I thought about it before because I owned a bunch of domains. Back then, uh -huh. I owned over 3,000 do domain names. I, would, I wow, was domaining too, yeah. so I would buy and sell and trade domain names. I still have about 100, maybe down to 80 now. But um, I would buy and sell and trade domain names. Well, exactly. now, I'm, now I'm in the same space you are. I'm looking for acquisitions. I'm yeah. buying stuff. But it's a lot easier these days because you have third-party vetting tools. The analytics are in the cloud. It's common these days to write a little bit of the uh, purchase price in performance over time, right? So you give them some money up front. Yeah, that's so right. Yeah, exactly. I date myself back then. I got out of it for a long time. Uh -huh. I've done, done everything since then. Oh, uh, yeah. I worked with some of the biggest websites on the planet back in the day when dot-coms were the thing. Let's go back to... What were some of the first acquisitions? You, know, you, you did some acquisitions for friend investors. What worked really well with them? What did you, you, you did the social media company and sold it. I see on your website, you called it a micro PE or on your, on your profile. So if you said yeah. it's a micro PE, I get it now. Yeah. You started where I started. Like you started, you know, yeah. college kids. I was still in college back then. Um, I was in college probably longer than I should be. I have a bunch of degrees. You started really small there in, in, in the terms of not, you know, not in your yeah. world and not in my world back then. But in the terms of the PE world, you know, your first acquisitions yeah. were very small. What did it look like to, you know, 
buy the bigger you know what was the what was the next biggest thing you bought i mean did you buy anything so far that like really like well that was a lot you know it's a big difference now yeah, yeah i mean for the for the most part for the first few years we were staying under six figures mm -hmm. so low mid high five figures mm -hmm. and friends and family because i was still kind of learning you know mm -hmm. as we went and i and it was other people's money and especially spending time so i didn't want to lose any money that oh, was the thing yeah. that yeah. i was playing yeah i was playing it safe and probably for four or five years, we're just, you know, going nice and easy, slow, steady, uh, not ramping up. And we started and we had like moved to content sites then after the first two years, like one and a half, two years. So we're only doing content websites, display ads, mostly some affiliate mixed in. Um, and uh, in around 2019, I'd say 2019, 2020 is when we, you know, started leveling up, if I may. And... Uh, we launched our group buy, which is it's like the fun, but it's like a group buy where we pull money from multiple investors into mm -hmm. a multi-member LLC, mm -hmm. a Wyoming LLC, and then we buy multiple businesses and websites using those funds. Why we did that was because the one-on-one -on -one investment that we were serving our clients with, the minimum for that uh, was about $100,000 because anything lower, it would not even cover our fee. So there won't be much left for the investors to pocket. So we said, you know, a lot of people out there who don't have 100,000 lying around and they still want a piece of this action. So we offered a, a group buy to them for which the minimum was $25,000 and that kind of went off well. So we started in 2020 and uh, last three years, we did about 1.04 million across three rounds. But we did one each year. It's like a rolling thing. We keep adding to it. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to be doing it more frequently and hope to be at like around two, two and a half million by the next year end. And also in 2020, we, we partnered up with the Empire Flippers Capital. They had a new program, uh, Empire Flippers Capital, wherein they were pairing up uh, portfolio operators like me to investors that wanted to invest in websites because they have a list of investors mm -hmm. uh, who, who did not buy only because they could not run the business. So they kind of paired us up and uh, we raised about four, 4.1 million across three rounds in 2021, 2022, 2023. And we deployed all of that money to buy content sites. The last one we bought was about a million dollars uh, and bought for about 30, 40X. And, uh, we are looking to exit from the round for the first and the second round now, uh, so that because the life cycle is almost coming to an end. So yeah, so we raised about five to six million just from these two uh, ventures, and that's apart from the one-on-one -on -one investors we work with. Yeah. So yeah, that's how we are where we are right now. I think we do mostly mid six figures and above uh, now. So okay. the, the limit for individual investors also has increased to two hundred thousand dollars now to work with us. It's up hundred k. Yeah. So uh, let's cover a couple of things real quick. When you said it's thirty to forty x, for those of you guys listening and who buy brick and mortar companies and they buy them at three x, the difference between what he just said and what you what you're thinking of is in the brick and mortar businesses, you're buying off a of three x of profit or, or SDE, EBITDA, those type of things. And what we do on these, most of these websites are extremely profitable, meaning that they're, if they're running at 75% profit margin or below, they're not running it correctly. Uh, there's something wrong. So usually they're at 80, 85, 90% profit margin. It's one or two guys, a writer, a SEO guy, and, and the website. So in this world, we trade at multiples of revenue. So the yearly revenue, so when he's, or monthly revenue, and it's based off the trailing 12 months so when he said 30x or 40x he's taking the last 12 months correct me if i'm wrong but what you're doing is taking the yes. last 12 months of revenue averaging it across the last 12 average. months it's the average yep. of the last 12 tra trailing 12 which was the right now would be right at the end of september it would be september back right or yes. at the end of you know august back if you depending on how you did it and you just look at the, the, the last 12 months and you do 30 the going rate right now is between 30 and 42 is what I'm seeing. Yeah, about 40, right. About right if it, yeah. yeah. If it's running really sweet, it's really good. They've got a great thing. And you might get, I think the best I've seen around there is 40, 42. So a lot of people hear that and go, you're paying what? I'm going to, I'm going to create a business uh -huh. and I'm going to do, I'm going to sell you a website, you know, 40 X. And I'm like, yeah, 
you know, uh-huh. it's forty. It's forty times your monthly. So it's still three x if you look at it. It's still three x. Still, yeah. that's what three x. Yeah. About that. Yeah. But it's three x your revenue. So if you uh, if you can go out there and create a six figure website that actually generates six figures, uh, call Mohit and me, and uh, we're interested. I'm only in the B and B world. B two B is my kind of thing. So marketing topics, uh, software review sites, that type of stuff. What do you guys de- yeah. delve into all kinds of stuff, or you you don't really care as long as they're profitable, or yeah, do you we- have certain industries you your or content types you look for. Yeah, we don't do adult betting or casino, all that stuff. But other than that, we try to go for evergreen niches. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we do lifestyle or hobby or tech. We have a couple of sites on the MacBook niche, Mac niche, basically, you know, yeah. Apple ecosystem. One on the PC niche. Tech is big. Um, and we have in the hobby niche. Hobbies are like, you know, people like to spend money in, on their hobbies. So yep. that's interesting. That's ever long lasting. Uh, when we I- try to go for things that are not too dynamic, like that's changing every day, because then our content gets outdated every day. When I get, when I once I get the kind of portfolio built out a little bit with some good software review sites, content sites in the B two B, if I decide to expand my market, I'll do what I call passion niches. Passion in my world, a passion niche or niche is a um, is anything where people will spend money, whether the economy is good or bad, you know or yeah. recession or not they're gonna they love their their sports spend their money, passion yeah. right and they're gonna spend money on yeah. it so golfing that would be one that like we had to be yeah, yeah. we had a couple on that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah people are insane about golfing you know and where i'm from and you know in the midwest or the united states here bass fishing or fishing in general people are gonna yeah. spend money they're gonna go fishing whether the economy is good or bad if they're gonna figure out a way uh, i don't think that you know the economy it's going to hit them very hard so long as you're talking about the average Joe and not some sport fishing yeah. book or something. $200,000 uh, boats or anything weird. That said, um, you know, passionate niches. I, I might go into that realm at some point. The only thing I do, I think, different than you is uh, I'm actually looking at things that service those industries. So if, um, if, I, if, I, if I found a really good copywriting and, and, and content mm-hmm. writing service, I'd be interested social media management or somebody that really takes uh, like you did before once before they have great right. clientele and stuff and they grow yeah. and grow content you know i'd be interested in that and that's a service industry business but uh, i can run those from anywhere especially if they're already remote so those type of things i'd be interested in but yeah. do, you, do you guys go outside of the software or outside of the uh, you do any apps or anything other than the website no mostly content websites mostly yeah you know what you're running, you know, you know, you know, you're uh, yeah. here. That's good. That's actually a really good thing yeah, to like yeah, be in yeah, your lane. Yeah. Uh, my, cr- my criteria is I can run it from anywhere in the world because I haven't lived in the same. Now we are, yeah, we are pivoting now because content has gotten riskier, the content space overall in general. So we're moving into buying service-based businesses like agencies, SEO agencies, uh, marketing yeah. agencies. That, yeah, that. Be, you yeah. Know, even, even a podcast booking agency would be a nice acquisition actually, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Um, so those and software, we don't have the expertise, but we are building a few softwares in house mm-hmm. to get the jobs ready. Mm-hmm. And then we can, you know, because we don't want to buy something for you, make you invest in something that we don't know how to manage or run or grow. Right. So we got to do it with our own money first. And then we, you know, we can completely say that, okay, we can do it for you. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's a good move there. The reason I'm looking at the service yeah. industries is I use them, right? I look to buy things that I understand and or that I either like that are cost centers now, like you said, podcast yeah. booking service. I pay my, I pay a team of people to book people for me. Um, you know, I have a team of people who they vet the people who want to be on the show and reach out to people and ask mm-hmm. them to be on the show and all that. And uh, so that's a cost center at this point. So why not turn it into a profit center? Yes. We've done it a few times. Exactly. I've had people, exactly. I've had guests come on and say, Hey, I really like being on your show. Would you like to be on other shows? And like, you know, we can do that for you. Mm. And we just do a little, you know, one-off package for them. So I know we can do it well, right? Interestingly, yeah. Uh, I'm going to chime in here. So we did the same. So we were were managing and growing all these content sites. We had a huge team. We have 45 full-time people with us. And then a lot of contractors, freelance writers, experts, Mm -hmm. niche experts. So we were like, okay, why limit, you know, this management service to just the people who have invested through us? Why not right. offer to everyone? So we, we just launched Black Book Digital a few months ago. And now we cater to everyone. Even if you haven't bought a website through us mm-hmm. or invested with us, that's fine. If you have a website, if you want to need 
full service website management, or even a la carte services like content or, or backlinks or WordPress management, just simple. We can, we can cater to you now because we have the bandwidth. We're doing the same thing anyway. So might as well offer to more people. So yeah. One of the things you said there, because you raise funds and there's a reason why I'm resisting this. Um, I have, I do have private investors, uh, that I work with, but I don't raise funds in the traditional set sense because I don't want to be forced to sell. So what I do yeah. is, uh, I give my private investors the ability to claw back the, the, uh, mm. the investment, meaning that after a certain period of time, I usually do it as a debt plus equity. So I pay them off. So ah, if, uh, okay. if somebody comes in and they want, like if I buy something I want to hold long term, when I raise the money for it, I'd like, okay, put in a hundred thousand, uh, we'll pay you back over the first three years at a hundred thousand of your money plus a certain percentage of income. And you still make, you still are a, you know, five or 10% minority owner. Not, yeah. Yeah. So you're part owner, owner, but you can't make me sell it, you know, for, when it's profitable and running and, yeah. and doing its thing. What is the life cycle you talk to, you talk about having some that are at that time. That's one of the things about yeah. raising funds where you're just strictly raising capital and people are investing in sites. They need liquidity. They need to be able to put their, you need, you know, there's a thing called velocity exactly. of money is how, how many times the money turns over. So does that make you sell things you're not quite ready to sell sometimes? No, mostly no. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I sell when I think it's the right time to sell. It could be earlier than we are expecting to sell or later than that. Mm -hmm. But the ideal life cycle would be anywhere from two to three years. Two to three years. So uh, that's what I was curious because I heard you, you mentioned that in our previous little chat there. Yeah. You were saying that you had a couple of sites or something or at that, that yes. point where it's time to start considering selling them. And uh, I also interviewed uh, Treasure Hunters, the, guy, the guys that run that. And they had a website right after we had, had the interview, they sent one over. And I'm like, why would you sell this? It's extremely profitable. And then I realized they raised a public fund, right? They did a private placement memorandum, reached out to accredited investors, and they promised a timeline. And now they're getting, you know, that fund bought X number of sites. This is one of those. And it's a couple million dollar site. Unfortunately, it's like I said, I'm buying stuff, but I'm buying things I can improve. And he had the same playbook I, I'm trying to build. It's one of the reasons I interviewed him is like, what do you do to these? Like, it was probably at its max profit potential. It's making uh, as much money as it's going to make every month. It, it might grow because of getting more followers, but there were no, yeah. hey, swap this ad service out with this one and get an yeah. improvement. Or low hanging so, fruit. Yeah. Yeah. No. All the low hanging fruit, he'd, he'd already, he'd already fine tuned this thing. Like, I'm looking for things that have not been fine tuned yet. That they they're using AdSense instead of some of the more profitable you know services that are out there. They're using you know Amazon you know for the affiliate products when they're probably the lowest yeah. paying around, right? So what does it look like on what does the search look like for you guys? Uh, you still you farm Empire Flippers? Do you farm Flippa and all those on a regular basis, or do you guys do cold outreach like I do? I mostly cold outreach. Um, so I don't yeah. like the auction. It's a multi, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a multi-fold strategy, to be honest. We made a name for ourselves in the market space and uh, people know that we buy sites all the time. So we, of course, look at the marketplaces, like mm -hmm. Flippa, uh, you know, we look at brokers and mm -hmm. international empire flippers, mm -hmm. quite light. They know us, we have a relationship with them. So they keep sending us deals. We also uh, have our own outreach approach. If you're looking for something specific, we do the outreach for that. Mm -hmm. Then we also have an inbound approach where people who know that we already we buy sites often or who have already sold sites to us, they come to us oftentimes if they have something else to sell. So we have a good inbound pipeline also. So it's a multifold strategy uh, that we, you know, utilize. I love that, that uh, if they've already sold sites to you, what people don't realize is some people are out there are just really great creators and they know how to create a good site. They know how to build something. They know how to get revenue to it. And then a year into it, 18 months into it, they either get burned out or bored and they want to like get the next biggest idea. And they could be making six figures on these sites and they got the next biggest idea and they'll, they're going to call you back over and over again. Hey, yeah, I, exactly. I've got to tell you. Or, you know, or they try multiple things at once. Well, this one's making yeah. six figures, but this one's really taken off. And now it's just a distraction, yeah. right? It's no longer an asset to them. It's a distraction yeah. from what they really yeah. should be focused on. So it's, you got to build rapport with these sellers, even if you don't buy their current exactly. website, because you don't know what they're going to create for you in the next six months or a year. Exactly. You never know. Yeah. yeah. And some people just want, you know, to take chips off the table. Some people are not comfortable running a, a site that might be worth $100,000, but 
keep this out today, but it yeah. might be zero tomorrow. <laughs> so, so they want to take the chips off the table, you know? Yeah. So one of the spaces, and I want your opinion on this, uh, honestly, because uh, I'm concerned yeah. about it. Where do you see and how do you see AI affecting these content websites? I'm, I'm concerned with it, and I'll explain my concern. I want to hear your response first, but what do you course, see yeah. that so, as a... I don't see it as a threat, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of panic in the market due to which multiple they're falling down. Mm -hmm. But I think it's temporary because AI is only beating out low content, low quality content sites, I think. It is not going to replace a human who has actually tested a product that, you know, they have laid their hands on, shot pictures off, at least not in the near future. So that kind of content comes from experience and doing something yourself. You know, if, if let's say I'm, I'm testing a scope, so I have three really big sites in the scope and the hunting niche. Uh, you might be interested in them. I can share, share them with you later on because I'm, yeah. we're looking to sell those. So this girl who writes for this website, she works with us. She does videos with us. She actually goes to the range. She tests out the scopes and red dots and all that stuff and takes pictures and everything. So it is legit original content mm -hmm. with her own views because she has so much experience doing it. AI cannot do that. AI needs this content to be able to train. If right. there wasn't this content in the first place, AI would not have any content to write. So I think it's going to actually beat out the generic uh, content sites and kind of push the, the ones with the really good content up. And anyways, we only hire expert writers. We pay good money for expert writers. And uh, we, we, don't maybe pub we don't publish like in bulk, but we publish really high quality content with original images. So I think it's going to give us a boost. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is, it's actually going to improve our workflow in other ways too, which is the whole content planning process, you know? Now I can just tell AI to create a content brief for me. If I know what to tell the AI, it can create a really solid, tight content brief for me mm -hmm. with, all, with the whole structure of the article laid out, which I can just give to the writer and have them, you know, go at it. So, and right now it's being done by manually by our content managers who go and check out all the other competing pages, competing articles, then they see what's best from each and then they make the content outline, which alone takes a lot of time, like maybe an hour also or two hours to get a solid content outline done, which can be done quickly with the AI. So I think it's, it's going to help us in the long run for sure. And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner thinking about your exit strategy? Or maybe you've just landed a business through acquisition and the books just aren't the way you need them to be. Let me tell you about Reconciled, your dedicated partner for industry-leading virtual bookkeeping and accounting services. Reconciled pairs you with skilled professionals who empower you to grow your business and prepare for success, whether that's your exit or taking that new acquisition to top performance. Imagine having a high-level financial management without expanding your team, from bookkeeping to CFO services, tax advisory, and even fully outsourced accounting, Reconciled has got you covered. They help you make the best business decisions, keeping your end goal in mind. And the best part? Reconciled understands acquisitions as they have acquired three accounting firms in the past three years, and their founder, Michael Lee, mentors others in searching for acquisition, raising capital, or trying to to aggressively scale. Reconcile invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconcile.com today and let them get your books in order. Reconciled, making bookkeeping a breeze. That's Reconcile.com. It's interesting is I do some of my own writing just because we... Uh, I don't have the writer that write at the level I yeah. want to for some of this space, especially yeah. <laughs> the, like things I've studied and stuff like that. So yeah. if you see articles on like the psychological impact and stuff, I'm fascinated by the human brain. I like to study that stuff. A lot of times what I actually, I use AI. I actually tell it what yeah. I want to write on, what the topic is, ask it to create what it thinks an outline would be. And then I read that outline yeah. and think, what questions do I still have of this? Like, what is it missing? There right. There and then I, I add yeah. those to it. And then... I even have it, you know, you know, start with the, like, it even writes part of the article. But I, what I do is I just, every time I, as I'm reading through what it's creating, I just go back and ask it more questions. Like, hey, what about this? So if I, if I was a reader reading yeah, what exactly. questions would I have? And it creates a fairly thorough article if you can treat it that way. It's like a, it, does, it's, it, it still takes an hour or two to get a good article out of it. I think anyway, but that, 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 that same process to write that same article, it used to take me half a day, right? To, yes, yes. To research it's good for topic. prepping. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, sharpening the axe, you know, sharpening the axe. Yeah. It, it reduces the time the writer has to work on the actual content. It also, you know, apart from reach, you can also use it to compare your article to the top ranking article for that keyword. Yeah. You can put in the, you know, your own say, what can I do to improve my article? This is a reference article. So a lot of ways you can use it smartly. Yeah, I like that. The, the concern I have with AI, and I'll, I'll circle back around to this, is yeah, I think it's going to cut our traffic down quite, quite a bit. And the reason is, is as Bing's already doing this, uh, Google's talking about doing it, and they're doing it on some of their beta stuff, is if you ask a question in search side search engine, a lot of times the AI is just going to flat answer it without ever, like, especially like, how do I do this or how do that? A lot of those how-to sites, which I'm a fan of. I actually, you know, this show is called How to Exit. I have one that's called how yeah, to blog. Yeah. That I, I, you know, I own a, the domain how to blog and some other stuff. And the how to blog yeah. was just going to be an art, a bunch of articles on how to's and uh, yeah, starting yeah. to line that up. I owned that domain for a long time. And then AI came yeah. around like this might go away, right? If somebody yeah. says, you know, how to tie a knot or, you know, how to tie a so-and-so yeah, knot. Yeah. That article is very simplistic. Anything can write it. The AI does a great job at it because you're wanting a simple answer and being showing yeah. it in the search results, like the actual response to it is you do X, Y, Z. And I don't, though that traffic, the, the, a lot of that how-to traffic, I don't think is ever going to make it to a site like yours or mine. It's oh. going to stay right on the search engine. So in that yeah. realm, we got to look at like, you know, how do we switch things? How do we do things that are unique? Um, I like yeah. your idea, like, you know, unique content. I wouldn't mind owning a hunting oh. website and testing out yeah. gear all the <laughs> time, except for I moved to California and most of the... <laughs> Most of the stuff I would mount that scope on for, would probably not be allowed here. Um, yeah. I, I but I have a logic to, I have the logic to your, your uh, apprehension also, which might hold true or not. I have logic to that because all these search engines need to make money and they mm -hmm. do so by showing ads. Mm -hmm. If they don't send any visitors to your site, they don't have any ads to show to anyone. It's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, hitting themselves, kicking yourself in the foot. So I don't think it's it's going to be like they'll take away all the traffic or and only show answers on the search page. Maybe for some topics, maybe for some niches, but mostly they want to they want people to go to the site so that they can show their ads. I think they're playing with it right now because it's a cool new toy. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think they're once they start right. really, if they start seeing it, really digging into their revenue because uh, people aren't clicking on ads or basically they're. Yes you know, page view time starts shooting up because people are getting on their answers on, on the actual yes. Bing or uh, Google search or whatever, then logically there should be an impact on their revenue. I can see that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good response. We'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see how that plays out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to become a better and better writer. Yeah. So, and I pay, I pay for the paid version of that. Um, in the last six months to a year, Either I've become a much better person, like prompter, like asking questions, uh -huh. and asking yeah. deeper questions yeah. and asking deeper questions to get good yeah. articles out of it, or it's just become a better writer. Some of both probably. Like used to, and I trained it differently probably too, just because when it used to, everything was like in conclusion, in conclusion, yeah. in this and that, you know, every, <laughs> par yeah. every paragraph was like a, you know, yeah. a, a freshman college kid writing it. And now it's you know much more fluid than it used to be yeah. and i think it'll only get better it's a tool so, yeah. yeah how you use it is up to you it's a tool you know yeah so on the software side uh, you guys are doing that in-house first before you guys build out apps and yes. stuff my concern with yeah. with apps is um they tend to come and go so there's some tried and true like there's like if i think about my phone i probably i don't play I have, I have two games i play on my phone but i don't play games anywhere else like i don't have i don't have my son has an xbox but i i think they're a waste of time and i'm very competitive so if i have if i sit on his xbox i would play that damn thing until i beat everybody at that level right <laughs> so for the purpose of saving time i don't play those but uh i think about all the apps i try on the phone you know everything from meditation apps and stuff like that i burn through them so fast because i just the next best thing comes yeah. out. That would be my concern yeah. is like, does how I would have to, before I bought an app or even developed one, how, how do apps become sticky and hang around? You know, I'd have to yeah, understand so, that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's the reason we are not looking to apps anyways, because they're not sticky yeah. and you know, you run through them like faster than you, know, you run out of eggs maybe. So 
the thing is, what we're trying to do would be B two B SaaS. B two B SaaS out of me. Yeah, I talked yes. to a guy. I interviewed one uh, the other day. He bought a small B two B SaaS in the HR management realm, and now he's looking to grow it a little bit. Um, but you know, I didn't even know. Like he was, th- and I've been a tech nerd for years, but I'm on the Unix, yeah. Linux, and Apple side. He's on the PC side, but <clears throat> he's got this visual. He bought this thing that was built in like Visual Basic something. VB.net or something oh, like that or VB. something like that. Ah, v. VB. And, uh, net, yeah. <laughs> yeah, VB.net. And now he's trying to move it to the latest and greatest not .net architecture, whatever there are, are on Microsoft side. Yeah. And I don't know anything about that world. Yeah. But um, yeah. I, there are so many systems inside of big businesses, everything from CRMs, which are simple to ERP, or they call it ERPs or whatever, like yeah, enterprise, man, you know, enterprise management type of tools where it manages yes. everything, inventory. Uh, logistics tools, you know, you name it. A lot of people don't realize how many tools can be out there and you can build and people, businesses need, right? Um, I never, exactly. Exactly. until I ran this show and started interviewing people, I just didn't realize how much of that really truly existed in the space. So I, at some point like you, you know, you're probably a year or two ahead of me on that one. I might be interested in going down that path because I'm a nerd by previous I'm trade, but I would have to do what you're doing right now, build something in house, understand yeah. it, yeah. make sure I have a dev team that understands the current the current tech stats that are out there, what 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 we would be buying, and potentially the migration process. A lot of times you would be buying yeah. something that's on an old tech stack, and how do you yeah you like, want migrate to a new tech, to, yeah. yeah how do you exactly. like like this guy he's having to rewrite all his software because like nobody nobody's using the old tech you know the technology you bought. Right, he's having to port that over to new, yeah. newer languages and stuff. Which, what I told him, it's like AI probably helps with that now too, right? It's like, yeah, just yeah, yeah. But uh, and I come from that world. I mean, from a test engineer and engineering review, I worked for Lockheed yeah. Martin for years. We would take old government, you know, military intelligence systems. One of the service companies I might be interested in is not a Lockheed Martin, of course. That's huge, but uh. A company that's oh, yeah. real good at like they can take co- technology from from they can take something from assembly and move it to the co- current yeah. site. That, you know they come in they can do that for you and then help your that'd team. That'd be a nice agency. That'd be kind of a cool agency to own because it's just yeah. gonna that's something that would be competitive. You know, it's just gonna happen all the time. That as yeah, tech, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Take ages, you know, and new tech comes in, so yeah. it's gonna keep. If you had some yeah. expert programmers on staff that could look at something and go, yeah, yeah, that was written in this, and we can get it to that, you know and augment it with the AI and you get real proficient at doing it. I think that'd be a heck of a profitable consulting agency to own. Anyway, so um, what's your current uh, what's your current plans? You, you have a couple of sites you're thinking about selling. When you guys sell them, do you go back to where you bought them from? You put them on Flippa, you put them on Empire Blit Builders or, you know. We try to sell them ourselves first within yes. our network because we have built up a financial network. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that doesn't work, then then we go to one of the brokers, we buy a list, and uh, get it sold there. Yeah. yeah, like I'm a I'm a long term hold guy. Ideally, I like to hold things uh, yeah. for cash flowing. So yeah, we don't sell that often, but for this fun, we had a timeline, so we are going to you know respect that and sell yeah. them off the sites. That's interesting. I often consider doing a private placement memorandum and raising a fund. Yeah. But uh, that's my biggest concern is like, well, I have to sell something. I guess you could always buy it, you know, get get a product or a market valuation of it and then buy the investors out at a at that valuation. Right. But will they feel if you don't sell it to somebody outside of your own, will they feel that you did them right? That's my only concern is, right. If I do a third party valid, you know, evaluation and get a value for it. And then I say, you know, my investors own 30 percent of it or 50 percent of it. I just buy them out. Will they feel that it's fair because we didn't get into a competitive bid market type of space? Yeah, right. That's what I'm. And you want them to come back. You want them to. You want to hand yeah. that. You want to hand that check to them with them, and they go, "Great. Now here, here, take it back Wait, and reinvest." That was the next yeah. Try, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they want you want them to. Yeah. You want them to come back. You know, it happened to me all the time exactly. in the uh, in the real estate space. My my investors, I got down to where I was only needing about three or four private lenders because they they just fulfilled all my needs, and uh, and I had a few I never went back to. Oh, I and, get it. Anyway, let's circle back to what's your current investment criteria? What are you looking for? So if somebody's out there and they've got a website, um, give them kind of a high level. Hey, here's what we're looking for. If you got something, uh, we, we would buy it. So tell the listeners what you would buy if you found. If yeah. You found. So we're look, 
for like content websites monetized via display ads or affiliate income, ideally an evergreen space, evergreen niche, mm -hmm. uh, for which the content is like, like not too complex to write on and, uh, making, I'd say at least uh, five grand a month, if not more, like ideally it'd be 10 grand a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we can, we can look at it and it sh should have been around for like three, four years, if not more should have a stable history of earnings, traffic, and ideally if it's going upwards, that's even a plus point. We ideally don't look to buy sites that have been negatively impacted by a Google update. We try to avoid those. I'm not the turnaround guy. I don't do turnarounds. I like to buy things that are going up and, you know, make them go further. So yeah, if it's, if it's on a growing credit, even better. So yeah, in short, and also now we started looking to buying agencies also. So we're looking to buy agencies in the, they're doing at least, let's say 20, 25 K in SDE monthly. So like mm -hmm. 200, 200 get at least annualized SDE. And these agencies could be your marketing agencies, PR agencies, SEO agencies, link building agencies, any kind of agency mostly that does not require too much technical expertise. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to buy those as well and should not be reliant heavily on, on the founder. They should have systems and processes and people in place. So. Yeah. So uh, I'm working on one we talked about. I talked to, to you about yeah. it a little before the hand. Um, we'll see where it goes. I, I meet with the owners this, sure. uh, via Zoom this yeah. week. But um, a lot of these, even their their site, I can't say who they are or anything because of NDA, but even their site is really heavily on them, right? Um, yeah. Exactly. They're all over their website. They're all, all, all over the, uh, like their personal names are all over everything. And there's going to be a, a shift that's going to have to happen. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that without losing clients and customers because it's, yes. been, on, it's been on everything ever since the start. Let's talk about how do people reach out to you? What's the, uh, what's the way that you want them to find you? You have a unique domain name, so make sure people know what that is. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can write to me at mohit, M-O-H-I-T at B-B-I dot X-Y-Z. Uh, you can just... Google my name, write to me on LinkedIn or Twitter mm -hmm. or X rather. So Mohit Tater, M-O-H-I-T-T-A-T-E-R. Uh, yeah, it should be easy to find me. Okay. You said um, during your thing, you're talking about nothing too technical or nothing too uh, thing. Somebody brought me one like, hey, I, see you, I heard you buy, buy, to, buy B2B stuff. Like, yeah, they do in the, and it was in the merger and acquisition space, but they uh, did financial deep dive financial analysis on the industry and stuff. And uh, I was like, I don't have anybody to write on that. And it bores the snot out of me. <laughs> I, I don't want to write on it, but it was big, yes. like economic reports. It was, it, it made wow. good money. Don't get me wrong. But it, like, yeah. I would have to be like hunting the college scene down and trying to find the people who were exactly. very yeah. deep financial technical analysts to write these articles that they were doing. Exactly. A good friend of the family, they just, he just sold his business and they were doing you know, they've been around for years. They had a quarterly, yeah. I think it was quarterly thing in the chip industry. And they wrote the chip, mm -hmm. and, uh, they basically analyzed the uh, microchip and industry. They were doing, I, to be a, to be subscribed to their, what you would call newsletter or reports or whatever they yeah. did quarterly, whereas six figures a quarter. So, and companies were paying this. Like uh, they had, they've been, mm. his dad, second generation, his dad and him, He's older than me by a few years, so he's probably 55 or so. And his dad, created him and his dad created it together. Yeah. Travels the world, analyzes the space. But when they sell that, they had to sell it to somebody yeah. that had that technical expertise that knows exactly, this version yeah. of silicone versus that version of silicone. Where this yeah. stuff be in mind? Is there any shortages? All the economical impact, uh, right? You know, yes. butterfly flaps its wings. In some places that impact, or they see a, a storm or something somewhere and that's going to impact the mining industry in that area. I don't want to own anything like that. So I can see that you don't either. You don't need to own anything that's so complex that finding writers for it yes. is, you know, number exactly. one, yeah. number one, there's six figure writers yeah. because they're, they, they have to be, Yes, you got a PhD. There are only so many. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they, I don't, only they can write good stuff about this. Exactly. Yeah. So I'd place that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not interested in that either. Like, if you have to have a PhD <laughs> or a, even an engineering degree to write the article, probably not yes. the right B2B yeah. site for me. I get that. Not that. So, well, I appreciate your time here. Is there uh, anything you want to leave? Like, is there any big takeaways? Like, uh, if you're out there looking, if you want to get started, what would be a good lesson learned that you could give people if they want to do what you're doing, what they want to do where I'm starting off? 
what would you tell them uh, like as far as a, a quick uh, sound buy yeah. to, to where to so, get started? If you have more time than money, go build a site or buy it yourself and grow it. Mm -hmm. But if you have more money than time, you know, you can come to companies like us and help us get you that high ROI that you can, you know, probably not get in a lot of places yeah. other than this. So, but yeah, if you have the time, we should definitely see how the thing works, how the online business space works, how these websites work, because then you at least know, even if you're giving your money to someone else, you'd know what they're doing and if they're doing the right thing or not. So yeah. it's good to go through it yourself. And when he says us, he means BlackRock Investments. Unless I know you and we've been doing business for a while, I probably I probably won't won't help you place your money anywhere. That said, uh, I appreciate you ha having you here today. If you ever need anything from me, let me know, and we'll call that a show. Really, Ronald. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you so much, and great great being here. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now